this episode of the Storytellers Podcast, I have the pleasure of once again being joined by the Australian economist Steve Keen. Steve was previously on the podcast to talk about the bad economics of climate change. In this episode, he talks to us about the current state of a global recession, inflation in Australia, and the housing market. Now, without further ado, I'll give you Steve Keen. So, um, so basically, with the advent of the um, pandemic, the world at large and Australia began the beginnings of something entering, entered something like the beginning of a recession. So Australia um, went into a recession officially for the first time in 30 years. And to try and combat that, we saw um, the government implementing policies like JobKeeper, JobSeeker, and various other COVID payments, trying to flush the um, economy with um, money, basically, and try to sort of uh, keep economic growth stimulated. Um, but now once the economy has reopened um, properly, and we're sort of on the tail end of all of that, we're seeing rising cash rate, rising interest rate, and the talk of inflation. So perhaps, Steve, maybe for us, you could firstly, just give us an idea of what inflation means, what that actually means, and what we're kind of looking at, what situation we're looking at here in Australia. Okay. Um, just I'll, I'll clear some detritus out of the way, first of all. A lot of Austrian-inspired right. economists will tell you inflation is the increase in the money supply. Well, that's bullshit because they're actually saying what causes inflation? Increase in the money supply. How do you measure inflation? Increase in the money supply. Forget that nonsense definition. Uh, inflation fundamentally is an increase in the average price level. But the trouble is then you have to calculate what the average price level is. And that involves a range of indices. So you'll take this year's quantities times this year's prices and divide it uh, and, and subtract that from the, the previous year's, subtract that the previous year's uh, uh, pro, uh, quantities. Uh, but it's just the same quantity, but different prices. It's all sorts of, it's P times T minus X times T. Uh, P times P times X is the price times. I'm getting. I'm getting. I'm trying to work equations in my head right now. Not a good thing. Not a good idea on, <laughs> on a on a show. But the basic story: you you have the the price the price change on the vertical axis multiplied by the quantities for this year the same the same year, and then you have the price level the previous year on on the bottom axis. And there's two ways to do the indices. And of course, you're adding up all sorts of commodities, and you have to include you know something that's supposed to be representative of the average consumer. So there's inflation is is very difficult to measure, easy to hypothesize about, very difficult to measure. So it's, it's an increase in the general price level, but it takes an right. index to work out what that is. And the the important thing to me is that like we're almost without fail, the knee jerk reaction of a, of neoclassical economists is, oh, if prices are rising, it must be because of uh, a wage price spiral. Now, if you look right. at what's going at the moment, prices are increasing by about eight percent and wages by about three percent. That's not a spiral. That's a collapse. So you, you, there's no way you can say wage pressure is driving up driving up prices, and you have to dive into the the actual constituent parts of inflation. So you have effectively uh, sort of three factors you need to look at. One is the the cost of production. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What is it? You simply, simply flat. What does it cost to get goods out you know, in, in in into a factory out the door? And that also involves the time in production as well. The, the turnover rate. Uh, for in manufacturing, now what we're seeing with COVID is a huge blowout in that. Okay, if yeah. we've so relied upon China, the the length, even even without shut factory shutdowns and cut off to supply and missing components and so on, because of COVID, the time that it takes to get those those goods from raw materials to output is extended, and that's increasing the cost of production. And there's nothing any monetary policy can do about that. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so you have that, that cost of production, the per unit cost of production, or that's where you say, look at how many you know, units of labor to produce the unit of out, uh, output. Now, normally, that's where you get your wage pressure coming from, but we're seeing wages in real terms falling quite sharply right now. So that's not mm -hmm. the source. The other is the markup that manufacturers put on their inputs. Mm -hmm. And that has risen quite substantially. So what you've got is effectively, it, it's not a not demand-driven uh, inflation it's partly supply driven but it's also 
manufacturers putting up markups because there's such a high level of demand. And that high level of demand relates back to what you were talking about a moment ago with all the uh, monetary uh, injections by the government uh, mm -hmm. during COVID. And uh, can I share a screen, by the way, just to show something I think people should see to have a, a picture of just what this last recession was like? Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think okay. you're able to. You've got to allow it. So if you go to security and then enable screen sharing. Right. There we go. Okay, right now, let's go. So I'll do uh, this screen. Now, that that's the unemployment rate in America. And I want people to focus not to you see how it's, you know, it blew up and, and plunged under COVID. Now, look at the mm -hmm. little gray bars you can see there. And the gray bars tell you the duration, how long was the economy in recession. That is barely even visible for 2020. It's the shortest recession in the post-war period. Right. So that was the that was the impact of the fiscal stimulus. So I, I might make a point of the gut, you know, that hadn't been done. We would have had a collapse of the incredible scale because uh, private credit, first of all, rose dramatically because people are borrowing money just to pay their outgoing bills. But they would have rapidly gone bankrupt without those injections. So that, those injections mm -hmm. of government money, uh, extreme fiscal stimulus, stopped us going into a, a, a crisis that would have made the Great Recession look like a, a cake war. A, you know, a, a, it, it's would have been a party. They like saved us. Uh, so those, so those yeah, uh, government stimulus us. was incredibly would, yeah. important, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm, I, I don't think it was done well enough, and I think it went to the wrong people, and and the. Uh, and it wasn't sustained for long enough, but without it, we'd be in a total catastrophe. But that, of course, also means people had enormous spending power with an increase in their bank balances. They couldn't buy a whole lot of services, and and therefore that was a huge demand pressure. And that means that that re re enables firms to put up high markups, which they can't do during a downturn. So I think partly our inflation has been driven by that. But if you want to say well, who's, who's responsible, it's markups and manufacturing. It's the cost of production particularly the blowout and the extent the length of time that it takes to get production done um, and the markups by firms, not wages, by any means. So, um, so that, that, that's the important thing. Yes, we've had inflation, but it's been driven by an increase in the cost of production caused by COVID. Okay. Also, we're seeing, in, in, we're getting close to a point of incredible pressure on oil, okay, the cost of oil. Not just because of not because of the Russian Russian the, the Ukraine war is certainly part of it, but uh, it's also we're getting very close to where we're you know running out we're, we're running out of the capacity to easily pump oil out of the reservoirs we can now find oil in. So the, if you actually and that that cost gets passed on almost immediately. So all these cost pressures are there, and that's what's giving us the inflation right now, plus the markups from firms. Interesting. I thought I remembered from my um, a few years back from my university degree that um, during one of my chemistry courses that although um, that new oil deposits were um, being found reg regularly, and if not regularly, then the ability to econo um, extract them with economic viability um, was still on something like a positive trend but you're saying that that's um oh, that's it, it, in terms of peak, in, in terms of terms of in terms of normal oil so oil we find in reservoirs not oil we find in rocks <clears> like with shale shale oil uh right. we've been in a downward spiral for 20 years so the only okay. reason there's been increasing volumes of oil has been uh, unconventional mining and fracking uh right. and that's become that's become cheaper over time because the technology has improved dramatically it involves a lot of horizontal mm -hmm. drilling and things mm -hmm. of that nature um uh, but it is still, um, it, you know, still more expensive than getting it out of the out of the ground from reservoirs. And yeah. uh, but the you know, the, the energy we're taking to put that get that out is rising has has risen dramatically over time. And that that is a cost which is coming our way courtesy of just depleting the, res the resource, let alone the carbon dioxide effects of it all. So you know, I think I think we're in a period where at some point we're going to be. Um, Saying, well, if we just can't use any more oil, right? Okay. And then if we continue using it, then its prices will be drive up dramatically, and that will cause cost of production to rise. And that means that both workers' workers' wages and manufacturers' markups are going to be challenged um, because there simply isn't the margin there anymore in terms of the energy costs. Uh, yeah. 
prices will lag, but the end, it's, it's really the approaching limits to energy uh, that are going to cause that to be, I think, a continuing feature. Yeah, and we're seeing similar things, I believe, in um, similar uh, cost pressures and supply pressures on um, LNG as its usage as a transitionary yeah. um, fuel. And then that having implications yeah. for was, things like was... uh, fertilizer production and what have you, all kinds of other yeah. uses. Yeah. People... People who simply aren't conscious of how far, how widely oil is used as an input to our uh, mm. lifestyles, including food. We, we talk mm. about a green revolution was actually a brown revolution, maybe black if you, if you take the actual color of oil, because without <laughs> without the manufacture of fertilizer from the oil, we would be able to support maybe one third as many humans as we currently have. The Haber Bosch process. Now, so that sort of thing, people simply aren't aware of how dependent we are upon continuing use of oil when climate change is telling us we're going to have to stop using it completely mm. anyway back to the, <laughs> the climate change tangent there um, back to um, back to the inflation topic so to, so you said that it's not um, it's not monetary supply it's not wage growth that's effectively causing our inflation it's it's production it's production pressure and passed on costs from yeah. um, from manufacturers and you could see you could very early in the pandemic you could see markups um in goods and various goods and services like gym equipment for example um was massive mm -hmm. massive demand and just quickly diminished supply you see it with vehicle manufacturing um the secondary vehicle manufacture uh, market in australia has just absolutely skyrocketed um as a result and so I suppose, well, just to speak to that point of wages. Um, so wages, and this is something that I just briefly wanted to touch on. There's the the old adage or adage, or however you pronounce that word. I suppose that the that in the recent past in Australia, but perhaps in America and maybe various parts of the West in general, that inflation has gone up, but wages haven't gone up. Wages have been stagnating for some time. Um, is there, is there truth, um, apparent truth to that comment in Australia in particular? Oh, yeah, not as much as America, because Australians have seen an improvement in their standard of living since 1975. But when you look at the average American worker, in many ways their, their per capita disposable income has flatlined in real terms since 1975. So right. Australians aren't quite that bad. Uh, but like all the pressure, you know, abolish unions, unions are terrible, God, unions are awful, look at the price rise, it's all unions, yada, yada, yada. Um, that, yeah. that sort of rhetoric, you know, mainly out of the Liberal Party, but of course even Labor to some extent was doing, because Labor began the whole idea of using superannuation as a trade-off against inflation. Um, it's It's been reducing the power of the working class to, to campaign for a share of the increase in productivity. And uh, America's worse on that front than Australia. But it has happened in both countries, right? And so, what we're seeing now in terms of rising um, interest rates and the rising cash rate, which I believe is set to rise further um, next year, I'm not sure. Probably. Well, the, 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 hmm, yeah. Um, so, and th that being then the, this um, contractionary fiscal policy as an attempt to curb. Uh, rising inflation, um, unless I'm wrong there. Uh, what what implications can we expect from that um, going forward? I think it'll Australia? cause a recession. I think it'll cause a recession. Mm -hmm. It'll certainly cause a fall on the house price index. Now this is this is the you know the only thing Australians seem to worry about is the house price index. Um, yeah, that's that's the focus of government policy, keeping house prices rising. Uh, when rates are going up as much as they are, people are going to be unwilling to take on an extra mortgage debt. And, and banks unwilling to lend, you're going to get negative credit coming out of that. Negative credit will mean a drop in aggregate demand, uh, mainly hitting the finance, hitting the asset markets, the you know, housing market in particular, but mm -hmm. it'll also affect the real economy. So I think we'll get a recession out of it. And then the central banks will reverse direction. Now, whether it'll actually reduce inflation, uh, you, you can't, you, if you reduce wage rises even any more than you've done already, given the increase in essential inputs like energy, you're going to end up with riots like you're getting in France and, and Germany right now over the cost of living. Um, yeah. You're simply it's just ridiculous to say you want to have workers' wages cut. The only thing you can hope to cut through 
causing a recession is manufacturers' markups. So right. that that may be the way you get a you get a price fall coming out of that interest rate rise. But what I expect to see is that that'll also cause a, a, a sharp fall in house price, which we're seeing already, of course. And at some mm-hmm. stage, the, the RBA will reverse direction because the desire to maintain you know, rising house prices is so built into the Australian psyche. They'll do whatever they can to do it. I don't think. I don't think they so long as rates are you know as much higher as they are now. Like you know, you're getting what rates hitting what six percent or so. I think at the moment, aren't they in Australia? Yeah, I think something like that. Something around that level. Uh, that's going to so people took out mortgages with with you know fixed rates of two percent, and now being faced you know three times three times the interest payments effectively. Um, yeah, you just can't. Yeah, you're just not so credit, to hack, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you still the data. Unfortunately, the data that I've got lags the um, the actual um, uh, real world by quite a substantial margin. I'm using a bank of international settlements rather than having access to, uh, you know, the minute by minute data price levels you get out of some of the Australian uh, finance sector these days. But mm. it, it's still seeing at that stage rising credit, meaning rising house prices. But now we're getting falling credit and therefore falling house prices. So why does why does Australia have such a fascination then with rising house prices? It seems to me that house prices are high enough already and getting to the point where they're um, being... They're insane. They're insane. Yeah. They're insane. Uh, they're far higher than they are. They should be. The house should be a place you buy to live in, not, not, a, not an item you speculate on on the stock it's, market. Yeah, it's become, it and seems to have become just an investment by. market for sure, rather than yeah. an actual living yeah, housing I mean, market. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and that is, and, and the reason it's actually worked is because what, like, I'll show you a chart if I can do another screen share. Um, is that okay? Okay. This is a new software package I'm working on. Uh, but this, you can see there, this is Australia's, the, the, the black line is the annual change in house prices, and the red line is the annual change in credit, credit being uh, new, 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 new uh, household debt. So I define credit as new household debt, okay, with the, the, the change in household debt. And the change in credit, and the, you can just see it, they, fit, they fit each other like a glove there. And that applies to, you know, if I, if I take a look at Spain, for example. I'll go to with Spain. Okay. You get the same sort of pattern for Spain. You get it for, you know, say, so United States. Um, this is a global phenomenon, not just Australia that does this. But the what actually drives the rising house prices is rising levels of new lending by banks. So in a sense, it's a it's a game for the banks uh, that enables them to um, make a fortune because they're the ones who largely profit out of rising debt levels. And we get sucked into it. But once you get sucked into it, it, it becomes part of economic policy in a sense because the governments aren't aware of why, and neither are mainstream economists aware of why. When you have a house price bubble, you'll have a booming economy. The reason being, people are borrowing money, and they're spending that money into the economy, and that's increasing aggregate demand and aggregate income. And the reason that the mainstream doesn't understand is they give Nobel Prizes to idiots like Ben Bernanke. Not, he's not stupid. He has a stupid economic theory. Okay, uh, But Bernanke, Bernanke dismissed the... Uh, a debt, a debt theory of what causes Great Depression on the basis that uh, lending is a pure redistribution which shouldn't affect demand. And, and that's living in a world where banks are uh, intermediaries who, who take in money from savers and lend that out to depositors. And that's categorically false. The Bank of England came out saying that in 2014. The Bundesbank in 2017 saying that those theories are nonsense. But that's what economists still learn. And in that world, uh, change credit has no impact on aggregate demand. Now that's their fictional laws; they can't see it coming. But when you have a house price bubble, you have increase in new credit, and that credit turns into aggregate demand and income. And so, a house price bubble makes the economists and makes the government look good, even if they don't know why it worked. Then, of course, the downside is a crash will come along later, and Australia has continued pumping it so that that crash has been forever postponed. Uh, until the COVID recession. But now I think with rates going up as much as they are, we'll get the negative credit effect out of that and have a recession in Australia as a result. And then the government will reverse direction and try to repump the market again. So 
housing prices have been um, so exorbitantly high because the government or government, the banks are effectively using them as a financial tool to stimulate the economic growth, basically, at the cost of um, effectively at the cost, as it seems to me, to younger generations trying to enter the housing market um, with Absolutely. with wage as we well you've you've said that wages are, are rising to perhaps a greater extent than you see in America but perhaps aren't matching what they what they could be in terms of price rise um, real, well they're certainly prices. behind price rises right yeah and in in the price rise we've had since since the end of the of the, of the mm-hmm. not the end of COVID but the end of the COVID crisis um, mm-hmm. that uh, the wages are definitely well below the rate of inflation. But before it, they were sort of added slightly above maybe a half percent per year uh, increase in, in real wages uh, when you might be getting, say, a 3% increase in nominal wages. Uh, mm-hmm. Now we're seeing still about a 3% increase in nominal wages and an 8% increase in the price level. So, um, no. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so... And so we're experiencing look a crash. What's likely to be a crash at this point? But you're forecasting just this con- another rise after that fact. It's not going to be so. Well, I mean, it, it depends how much the government. You know, they're, they're reaching limits because, like the the, the level of household the level of um, of private debt in Australia peaked back in two thousand and seventeen, roughly. It's been heading down since then, but it's still a massive level of household debt. So that was, I did a little rectangular hyperbola, which you, coming from an engineering background, you'd appreciate, where I had the debt level on the horizontal axis and the, and the interest rate on the vertical. And you can do it like an isoquant iso- along that, mm-hmm. uh, and say any, anywhere along that curve is the same percentage of income being needed to service private debt. And what, right. whenever it passed 8% of GDP, there was a downturn. Whether it turned into a recession or another story, but there was a uh, in history going back to 1945, uh, the downturns in the Australian economy have coincided largely where, with where the interest rate burden for paying your mortgage, your household debt hit eight percent of GDP. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, where and what that meant was, as you had rising private debt levels, which the governments and economists were ignoring because private debt plays no role in their economic models even though they record the data, uh, what was happening was that rising debt levels, which their policies were encouraging, uh, were being matched by falling interest rates. And so you can see yourself being pushed into one little corner of that rectangular hyperbola. And now what's happened is, bang, we've suddenly gone up and the people have been trapped so that they've got to a point where it's you know, less than 8% of GDP because the interest rate is so low, and even though the debt level's high, it's, it's, a, it's a lower. And suddenly, bang, we've jumped quite a margin. We're over that point mm-hmm. where the interest rate costs are extreme. And these don't turn up in spending data because they, uh, your, your mortgage payments are not included as part of your consumption. So what okay. will be, what they have output minus uh, consumption is the way they measure savings. Uh, but that doesn't include expenditure on financial assets. So what's called savings is often an increase in the level of speculation. This time round, it'll be an increase in the burden of trying to maintain your house. Right. Which, of course, is, yeah, which is becoming greater. Right. So um, to zoom out a little bit, in terms of Australia suffering, entering into a recession, recession leading to a decrease in um, economic growth, GDP growth. You, what what does that actually mean for, I suppose, for a country? We've kind of touched on it in parts um, throughout this conversation so far, but for an individual, when someone says um, a recession, decreasing, decreased economic growth, like what does that actually mean for your average Australian, just rising potential for unemployment, well, cost it, of living? Yeah, yeah. Unemployment will rise, Okay. And then, of course, people who've got you know, mortgages or who are paying rent to landlords who have mortgages, um, they will be unable to service those mortgages. And then you'll have people being forced into uh, you know, asset sales because they have to. Uh, and I think before that even starts to become a wide trend, that's when the government will reverse direction on interest rates and try to restart the bubble. But I think because you're already hitting like a saturation level, that I haven't actually I'm going to bring up the data. 
<laughs> I should have the data in front of me immediately. I just want to find where I've got it in my machine here. But uh, when you look at the uh, the private debt, the household debt to GDP in Australia, it's reaching the point where you simply can't pump it any higher. But the success of policies in the past have relied upon pumping that debt level higher. So you're reaching a point of no return. The government may well try to continue boosting house prices, but it won't have much impact. Right. Quick, a quick note on that with the house prices. Can we expect, this is a personally relevant question, can we expect lowering house prices to result in uh, decreased rent anytime soon? Or Oh. Is that, is that how that works? What are you... What are you what what are, you, what are your thoughts there? No, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to work all that well. Now, the, um, the the rental market in Australia is a disaster as well. I mean, you know, the whole idea about privatising housing supply was it's going to make the, the market more efficient. Well, you know, bollocks to that. Uh, we'd actually be better off if we had some of the Singaporean system where a large part of, uh, of home ownership is, is, the, is government-owned housing provided cheaply uh, to mm-hmm. young, particularly young people. Uh, then we'd have we wouldn't have the pressure on rents, the scramble that applies. So Australia's got appalling rental rights, appalling uh, dominance of the landlord over the over the tenant, and that mm-hmm. if you don't do something about that, it's it's quite catastrophic. Um, I think I think you know, get landlords are being forced into doing it, and what's always going to happen? A lot of properties that people are currently using for Airbnb um, will suddenly come on the market for rental if they're forced to um, to liquidate. So, well, yeah, it probably will help could, a bit, but it's, you know, yeah. Where I am in Byron Bay is a stellar, where I'm currently living is a stellar example of, well, firstly, having a limited housing supply because of the laws they've had here for quite some time, limiting development. Um, but also the surround, all the majority of the houses here being investment properties um, bought by rich folk from Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, that then just use them for airbnbs and so yeah, of course the, saying, yeah yeah and then the and then the houses that you do have available for rent have exorbitant considering it's a little coastal town um an hour south of gold coast um have exorbitant rent prices um so one would hope that as you as you've just mentioned that airbnb these airbnbs may be um becoming just um regular rentals sometime soon but somehow i feel i'm not too optimistic about that fact for it's just no like too no much money it, here i think yeah yeah but so, if they find that they're going to if people are going to be forced to sell somewhere they're most likely to sell their so-called investment properties first off so you might find yeah. if you you know it, 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 the regional market has been pumped up dramatically over the last 10 years as well so this might help unwind the regional market more than it unwinds the city market in terms of mm-hmm. rental availability right so in terms of, because it, it's, it's a question that I've come across quite a lot of um, for my family, just from people in the public in general of which we, what we just talked about of, well, why should I care about the fact that if GDP is rising or not? But so in summary of kind of, of, of what we were just saying, GD, rising GDP or GDP that isn't falling, economic growth is important because it typically results in decreased unemployment, decreased cost of um and decreased t- cost of living um as its main two sort of factors one could say in terms of its effect on the average in- individual is that something like a simple but appropriate summary well in terms of if if if, if, you, if, if you wage if your income's rising faster than gdp to some extent or at least keeping pace with it yeah i mean we've, we've been caught up in, in worshiping economic growth uh in our civilization ever since it began, which is, goes back to the start of the Industrial Revolution. But I think the days of growth are over and, uh, and they were gone right. too far. But I'm, this is back to the climate change topic and we're going to be forced to retract quite dramatically in terms of production mm-hmm. levels and consumption levels uh, over the next, certainly like one or two decades. So but, uh, you know, the obsession with economic growth uh, has been as an alternative, thinking about distributing the income and wealth from the economy more fairly. And we've got the most, mm-hmm. when you look at Piketty's data, we've got the most unfair distribution of wealth, possibly in the history of humanity. If you go in back Australia to the Pharaohs, specifically, words, or just, no, or no, just globally, um, globally, across globally, globally, yes. Yeah, globally. Australia, Australia's, 
again, quite quite as not quite as bad as America, but the same sort of basic trend. But uh, Piketty's data took it right back to the Egyptians, and the 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 difference between the pharaohs and the slaves wasn't as great as the difference between Jeff Bozos and the uh, and third world uh, um, citizens, you know, poor people in the third world these days. Plus, also, I mean, even inside countries, it's an enormous inequality of wealth, and that we've let that get away with it because you've seen you know, rising income levels per capita. Um, mm-hmm. So the distribution has been ignored while the re- level's going up. If we start going in the opposite direction, then the distribution becomes absolutely critical because if you force the costs of climate change on the poor, you're going to get riots because that's basically me for a lot of like, certainly say in the, in the UK where I am now, if they let the price of energy, which currently applies here, run through to the uh, retail sector, then 40% of the UK households would be bankrupt. They couldn't afford to pay their energy bills. Mm-hmm. So if you let the price system rule in the situation, okay, currently you're going to have social breakdown on your hands, which is why all the European countries are getting involved in various forms of, of subsidies to the poor to enable them to still continue pay- purchasing energy. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think so. I think we, we have to get away from worshipping economic growth and uh, mm-hmm. I know that's outside the topic of this particular podcast, but that's that's what's got us in this dilemma: trying to grow continuously on a finite planet, and we're we are really at the, at the breaking point now, and probably past the breaking point in terms of being able to sustain a sedentary civilization on this globe, and that's that's going to come back and bite us. So, whether we want it or not, economic growth is going to end. An end to, as we've just mentioned, though, an end to economic growth or reduction in economic growth is going to have a disproportionate effect on the poor, will it not? Um, and and uh, what we're trying to do, I suppose, globally in terms of phasing out things like fossil fuels, which is in the short term at least going to lead to high energy prices, is again, as you just mentioned, um, is we're seeing an increase in prices in places like the places like the UK. But you will in third world countries as well as they're asked to transition, move away from fossil fuel production and transition to greener um, technologies. So that, what I suppose, is is that in your eyes a inevit- an uncomfortable inevitability that, that, your, that, um, that the poorer peoples of the world are going to have to suffer the brunt of our decisions? Um, to try or our, or our climate action, you could say in this sense, or which probably goes hand in hand with this movement away from um, um, economic growth. Or is, is, what's your what's your yeah. sort of take on uh, that? It, it, if we're going to have a decline in per capita income, quite quite caused by the end of the fossil fuel era, um, and if that's imposed on the poor, then you're going to have social breakdown because the poor will be facing starvation, okay? can't afford food mm-hmm. prices. That was a large part when the Arab Spring was actually driven by an increase in oil costs and an increase in food costs. So you had you know, you know, riots in, in Malta leading to what we then called the Arab Spring. It ended up with a totalitarian outcome, but that was the beginning of it. And the same thing would apply here. If, we, if, we, if those costs are passed uniformly through the price system to the poor, then the poor are so poor at the moment they've been living from hand to mouth. If they face like a forty percent increase in the in the energy costs and food costs or more, then they can't afford they can't afford to drive or they can't afford to eat. And in that situation, you get the sort of riots. You don't think they've been reported in Australia all that much, but riots over the cost of living on the cost so. of fuel in France and particularly in Germany, uh, quite 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 dramatic riots in the last uh, six months, four, three, three to six months. So you, mm. if a society doesn't make sure the poor can continue to stay alive as you have rising mm. energy costs and rising food costs because of global warming, uh, then you're going to have breakdown of those societies. So, so you, know, you, you can't impose... The, 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 the price system will impose the cost on the poor. Mm. We can't allow that to happen. Yes. Yeah, so, if you want to hang on to a civilization, so it's in your in your eyes, it's inevitable or necessary that we have to we have to make these changes, these transitions away from, um, let's say, this this centric idea of economic growth, but also mm-hmm. away from the use of fossil fuels that do give us actually that do give us relatively cheap energy, 
um, yeah. when it comes yeah. down to it, particularly compared to what we have available as alternatives at the moment. I know that a lot of one of the major criticisms or pushbacks, I guess, against um, rapid reduction of fossil fuel, fuel, fuel use or phasing out of fossil fuel use through disincentives like increased prices is that it disproportionately affects the poor and so the ethical grounds on that are in terms of for the environmental side of the or the ethical the humanitarian ethical grounds for that um combating against the environmental side of things aren't necessarily justified as they're coming those demands and those uh expectations are coming from the richer countries and the richer people of the world um and so i suppose in terms of what is a is it just is it just inevitable i guess that the, what am i getting at here it's just whether or, or not like is there is 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 a more appropriate path to try to minimize our our increasing costs of fuels in particular and energy in particular is that justified that continued use justified whilst we implement um in our in our search for the implementation of cheaper alternative energy sources so that we do not disproportionately affect the poor unless we can unless we can somehow figure out a dis wealth a better wealth distribution system like for example we've got cop 26 sorry cop 27 going on at the moment and companies not companies countries of the west in particular are making all kinds of pledges of um adaptive climate finance and um, um, hundreds of hundreds of billions of dollars to be sent to developing countries uh, for climate aid but hasn't happened yet and is questionable and how long it will happen um, so I suppose what's to kind of weave back to that what's in is what is the inevitable and do you think optimal course of action there like do they have a ground there's comments that these people are making. Do you think that it's worth taking into account, or is the the climate crisis so severe that it's we just have to make sacrifices? I've actually taken away from the topic you wanted to talk about, which is of course Australian housing and, uh, and inflation. Well, it, so. it, it it builds into the idea of um, yeah. maybe recession and global but, recession and energy. And, yeah, yeah. Oh, it won't necessarily but, be the next recession. This comes our way. Um, because this recession is being caused by government policy, you know, governments cutting right. back on fiscal stimulus and the central bank putting up interest rates quite radically. So this is definitely a policy-induced recession we face in the immediate future. But at some point, mm -hmm. yes, we're going to be forced. Uh, well, the destructive impact of what we're doing with fossil fuels will be so obviously great that even denials will have to shut up. Um, and in that situation, we'll be forced, what the hell do we do? And the, the sensible thing to do would be to drastically reduce our consumption of fossil fuels. But because they provide about 85% of our current energy inputs, that'll imply a total collapse in GDP and, uh, and, and income per capita. And if that gets imposed on the poor, then it's good by society. You'll get a sort of Mad Max type outcome out of but that. But also, do we even necessarily have the, the alternative fuel sources to replace fossil fuels if we were to face oh we don't no we don't anything we, about, no, we don't no, though no. so so they've it's they another feel, contentious they feel, issue we're going to be caught in a conundrum do we do we do we take account of just how serious the climate damage actually now is, is apparently is which you know it seems i'm waiting another year or two before we get something absolutely catastrophic let's say uh mm. could be we were lucky which might be 10 years but once it becomes obvious that this is just we can't we can't let this let this to continue then the choice. Well, what do we do if we don't continue? We get a collapse in our uh, in, in our recorded standard of living, GDP, you know, output of goods and services, consumption of goods and services. If we do, there's a collapse in, in in production and consumption of goods and services. So I think the only way forward is a rationing approach. We can't if we rely upon the price system, uh, like they didn't rely upon the price system in the Second World War. Okay, uh, you had r ration cards, so everybody got a, a ration of cigarettes and a ration of food and a ration of this and a ration of that and that meant that everybody uh of course the rich could find ways around that um but uh, 
the poor didn't die because they couldn't afford the prices. And as much of production as possible was put across to the war effort rather than to domestic consumption. That was actually the, the effective role of gov- selling government bonds to the public was to reduce the public spending power. Um, but that was compensated by the fact that most of what you were getting was on ration cars rather than um, you know paying money for them. So uh, I think we have to be in a similar situation. If we, we don't treat it as seriously as we treated second, the Second World War, then we're going to lose. Yeah. I suppose on that note, um, are you are you hopeful for the future, Steve? Are you hopeful for our our economics or our climate? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm getting uh, extremely pessimistic because I, I'm, I'm reading what economists write on this, and that they write absolute bloody nonsense that should never have been published in a refereed journal. And and then yet when I look at what's being decisions that are being made in the finance sector and also by a lot of governments. They're acting as if the economists have done their job properly. And I can tell you that's one as if assumption that's absolutely false. They've made up their own numbers. They've extrapolated from current trends using quadratics uh, as if, if, if there's going to be no change in the climate as temperature rises by 10 degrees. Just insanely yeah. stupid stuff. Um, only got published because scientists weren't refereeing their papers. If scientists refereed mm-hmm. the papers that Nordhaus and Mendelssohn and Toll and all this lot wrote about the cost of mm-hmm. climate change, they would never have been published. Okay? So mm-hmm. it's a, a real failure of refereeing process that that shit got 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 uh, publication, got the imprimatur of peer-reviewed literature. Um, but the result is that I know we've overshot drastically, and so and then there's you know I'm not the only person saying this, all and I've got data to back it up. Uh, in terms of the pressure we're putting on the biosphere, uh, we have to reduce that pressure uh, to be able to maintain anything resembling the climate in which our city advanced civilizations evolved. And we're not going to do it. And they've gone quite pessimistic. We've, we've fooled ourselves to believe it's not necessary or it's a minor optimization thing. So I just expect, you know, I guess, to find the climate saying, I'm sorry, this is science, not uh, not sociology and not economics. Uh, whatever you mm-hmm. want to have happen, this is this is the impact it's going to have on the climate. It's shifting. Get used to it. And in that situation, um, you know, we will then be in panic mode trying to repair the damage when the forces we're unleashing. Uh, you know, it'd be like trying to put an umbrella up against a tsunami. Good luck. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, good good notes for <laughs> good notes to end on. Perhaps. Um, and for us, for us younger, uh, younger generations that are going to have to live, going to have to live with that umbrella. Um, before before we maybe wrap things up, is there anything else that you think worth touching on or um, worth knowing about Australia's situation at the moment, its economic situation, its housing market, um, and what we can expect in the future? I suppose the, the one thing Australia's got to do is fix up its energy cartels. I mean, that's been quite obscene. That you're, the prices you're paying for, for gas are ludicrous. Australia has a, a major... I think what's going to ha- happen out of the whole crisis and the unwinding we're going to see over time is that uh, the production is going to be much more domestic. So if you have right. commodities which are useful for your own society, you'll hang on to them. You won't export them to anybody else. Now, mm. that's great for Australia in terms of raw materials. We have all the raw materials we'll ever need. And we could actually say, oh, we're okay. We'll just use this for our own, own consumption. We won't, we won't export anymore. Um, and that would actually work for Australia in a bizarre sort of way for a while. What we don't have is the manufacturing sector. If we say, mm. well, you know, we're not going to, well, where do our cars come from? Overseas. Okay. Mm-hmm. Where do our computers come from? Overseas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Australia lacks the manufacturing base to cope with what's likely to be coming its way in terms of a reliance upon domestic sustainability rather than uh, globalization. Do you see that being a a global trend of countries? Because we're in such a globalized, interdependent state at the moment um, internationally, and so you expect that the countries become more um, more dependent um, on local production and maybe more reversing na- more that national- trend back a little bit. Yeah. yeah, reversing that trend. But to actually properly reverse it requires investment. And uh, you won't necessarily have the, you know, you won't have the funds in private corporation to do that investment. So it's going to be uh, 
uh, you're better off to have a manufacturing base and some, uh, like in, in that sense, America have got both the manufacturing base, which is obviously better than Australia's, and uh, a lot of raw materials and resources as well. So in this strange little way, America could go back to a form of isolationism. Australia mm-hmm, yeah. just you have to re- have to rebuild this manufacturing sector, not quite from scratch, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, machine tools, uh, m- making machine tools. We don't do that. Um, all the things you need to be able to maintain an advanced industrial civilization we've run down over the last forty years. So Australia will be it'll have the raw materials, but it won't just have the knowledge about how to turn those into finish finished goods. So I right. think uh, so a, a lot of skilled labor. Yeah. Is perhaps what um, skilled and skilled. So uh, potentially an increase in um, in employment um, and job opportunity into the future in manufacturing and uh, and other skilled labor industries. Perhaps a movement away from uh, academic sort of enterprise. Perhaps um, and well, away from finance. School okay. and from yeah. finance. Oh, away from finance. We've, we've let we've let finance run the run the economy. And globally as well, of course, for the last forty years, and that's, mm-hmm. this is the state it's got us into. Finance has to be the servant against again rather than the master, and that comes mm-hmm. back to the house price issue as well. You know, we should never have let mm-hmm. let the, the banks create as much credit as they've created to enable the housing bubble to occur. So we have mm-hmm. to tame finance. So that's the, an essential part of trying to hang on to a advanced civilization after we realise we simply have to reduce drastically reduce our fossil fuel consumption. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a good point. I I remember uh, reading a book, I think by Michael J. Sandel, he's a political scientist, The Tyranny of Men- Merit, which is a fantastic book. Um, and he mentions, I believe that he mentioned in it that in the, he quoted, U, I think, UK statistics that 30, something like 33% of GDP was made up of um, uh, f- finance, basically, think, d- speculation, derivatives, stocks trading, whatever. An enormous amount of GDP, but contributed ne- next to nothing um, to actual real production or or real growth um, or re- in re- real growth in the economy, material growth in people in the economy, uh, which is so- sounds like a, a financial plague essentially that you're talking about that's dominating. Yeah, um, one world. of my one of my students it was way back when I was at the University of Western Sydney. One of my students said, uh, "Is finance a a profit center or a cost center?" Right. And we've tried to treat it as a profit center, but it's fundamentally a cost center, the cost of money. Okay. So if you actually want to have a, a genuine physically productive economy and you're measuring you know, physical goods and services, then the finance is a cost to the manufacturing that is not a profit center. What we've been celebrating is an increase, a dramatic increase in the overheads of production, courtesy of the finance sector. And those mm-hmm. overheads, like even Michael Hudson makes the case that if house prices were lower, wages could also be lower. And you could actually be competitive, not not as not totally competitive with India and Asia, but a large part of the reason for the, um, the inability of Americans to be competitive with manufacturing in the advanced the advanced developing country like you know, the Chinas, the Thailands, and so on, mm, uh, is because the cost of house they can't afford to be cheap because the cost of housing is so high. And this is this is partially Ricardo's logic about reducing right. the cost of corn was that. You know, workers get paid a subsistence wage. If the cost of corn falls, the wages will fall to match it. That will mean less money going to the landlords, but more going to the manufacturers. And in that sense, that, that particular point of Ricardo, which was the whole reason he dreamt up the nonsense idea of comparative advantage, by the way, but that insight about distribution well, of it's income. That's a nonsense idea, you think? <laughs> comparative it's advantage a, it's is quite bullshit. a big one in, in economics. Yeah, I know. I know. And it, the bigger the oh. idea, the more likely that. It, the bigger idea is in economics, the more likely it is to be idiotic. Do you want to just and maybe just quickly, what, what is what is comparative advantage, just briefly? Well, com- um, comparative advantage, the argument, each country should specialise in what's comparatively best at. So Ricardo gave the example of England and, and Portugal trading, trading cloth and wine. And that was that, in my it, economics course. It was cloth and wine from England okay, and okay. Portugal. Was yeah. it? Oh, they actually, yeah, they, they, that's, what, that's where it came from. Okay. That's now, that's where they're teaching it. Yeah, they're still teaching it like that. So, so what he said was he imagined that it cost, uh, like to make a certain amount of, of, of cloth, took, say, mm-hmm. 140 uh, English workers and 120 Portuguese. And to make a certain amount of wine took, uh, say, 180 English workers and 40 
quarter goes. That's not the numbers he used, that's just a rough idea. Mm. Uh, then it would there'd be a greater level of output of all the English workers specialised in cloth and all the Portuguese workers specialised in, in wine, and they could trade the excess with each other, and total output would go up. Mm. And a very clever debating trick. But there's one little problem. Okay? You don't just make uh, wine and cloth using labour. Okay, You also need machinery. Now, mm -hmm. how do you convert a wine press into a sheep dip? Okay, you don't. You don't? You don't. You, you don't. destroy... You destroy the capital; it becomes worthless unless you can export the, you know, the the wine presses from England to Portugal and the sh and the sheep dips from Portugal to India, England, which is just nonsensical as it happened. Given that particular example, um, mm. so you you actually have destruction of capital. You waste capital coming out basically. of. You destroy cap physical capital. We've got this economists. Economists are caught up in this whole vision of everything being malleable and substitutable, and they've taken that far past the point where it's actually sensible. Um, so they imagine you could substitute labor for capital, substitute energy for labor, blah, 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 um, mm. or substitute labor for energy. And that substitute just doesn't exist. So when you open up free trade, you often destroy productive uh, resources in both of the relative industries. So you make, you know, you, you don't you don't see a transfer of capital, you see a destruction of capital. So if you're going to get benefit out of trade, you've got to look at what happens over time. Do you cause more investment? Uh, in the aggregate out of deregulation mm. than you do. It's the investment question, not the efficiency of allocation of resources. So the, the, getting the whole obsession with that efficient allocation what we have now um, is a static view of the economy. This is why economists, it's ridiculous that they want economic growth because their models actually don't, in a sense, incorporate it uh, in, 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 in an under, underlying way. They're talking about efficient use of what we have now rather than increasing what we have now over time. Um, so comparative advantages is a, it's a call it a shell and pea trick. I've written a there's written a comedy uh, piece on that by the way, a cartoon book called Econ Comics, E C O N, right. Econ, Econ Comics. Um, mm -hmm. And if you the, the first one is on Ricardo and the whole idea of comparative advantage. Uh, there's other mathematical flaws with it as well. It's um, uh, so like the economists have proved. It, yeah, even so, even with the. Um... Initial, you could say something like the initial or gradual destruction of of capital, but also s skilled labour used toward for the production of that those goods and services. That's something you lose as well over time. I imagine yeah. it doesn't lead to a yeah. net positive increase um, in terms of that comparative um, uh, that sp or that specialisation. Not really. I mean, if you like the when you, when you look at the empirical data, and there's a brilliant database by. Harvard University, and I think also one other, I think MIT also has one called the Atlas of Economic Complexity. And when they look at that, the countries which are, which have the most developed economies have the most diversified industrial structures, not specialised. So diversification gives you growth, not specialisation. And that's the, very much the story with Germany uh, right. and, and Japan. Uh, they, they don't have the, Japan doesn't have the raw materials, but it's got an incredibly diversified industrial sector. And therefore, it's more, more able to innovate, to combine ideas together uh, than a country which specialises. So when you do the empirical research, the opposite result comes out. It says you should have a diversified industrial structure, <laughs> not a specialised one. So Australia's gone for the specialisation, and that's going to really hit us badly when we start finding the impact of climate change on globalisation. Right. So, and which, of course, will warrant a, a move towards uh Intradependence in um, in terms of our manufacturing and and our, our skilled labour supply. Well, independence, yeah. Well, interesting. Interesting in terms of what that potentially means, I suppose, for the future and the expansion of Australia's um, workforce um, away away from perhaps empty-headed degrees and. Um, um, pursuits, university stimulated pursuits, um, technocratic pursuits, which may be beneficial to Australia's society and culture at large as well, <laughs> just in the West more broadly. Anyway, Steve, I think we'll, I, I'm not, don't think I have any other questions there. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, thanks again for, for your time. Welcome and uh, chat to you next time.
Cheers. Thanks. Okay, bye.